the gospel displays God's sovereignty through election. Election is selection. God is the master potter creating vessels for his own good purposes. This is especially good news for Gentiles. Gentiles who were not God's people are now called his people. Those who are not loved have received a special saving love. All of this is possible because the gospel is centered on Christ. Christ who graciously grafts Gentiles into his tree. For the Jews, there is coming a day when many will be grafted back into the tree and be saved. And that's why the gospel is good news. Church, have you ever felt very burdened for the salvation of somebody else? Maybe for a family member or a friend or a co-worker or a neighbor, uh, just someone who you just like, it just weighed heavy on your heart, the fact that they were not saved. Have you ever gotten to the point to where maybe you, you've thought, man, God, I would just trade my salvation for their salvation? Well, if you're anywhere along those lines, you're in the company of the Apostle Paul. And that's where we find ourselves today in Romans chapter 9. If you recall, the book of Romans has been moving through major sections, which all mirror and call back to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. We've learned about sin, salvation, sanctification, being set apart, and now we get into the fourth major section on God's sovereignty. And how God's sovereignty is going to be displayed here in these next three chapters. And it kind of goes back and harkens back to the book of Numbers. And you might be thinking, well, how did Numbers line up here with Romans chapters 9 through 11? Well, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 14... The spies have gone out, Joshua, Caleb, and the rest of the spies go into the promised land, and they come back with a report of the, the large grapes that are there. They've brought grapes back, but they also report the giants in the land. And so the people of Israel, they're afraid, and they rebel, they, they grumble, they complain, they tell Moses, why didn't we just die in Egypt? So Moses intercedes for the people before God. And this is where God decides that those who over the age of 20 who have grumbled will not enter into the promised land, only Caleb. Now, Joshua and Caleb, they're going to lead the people in eventually, but the people, they hear this news from Moses that they're not going to enter the promised land. And they decide, okay, well, we're going to go into battle. And they're warned that God is not with them, and they go anyway, and many are slaughtered. Israel, the one selected and rescued, rebel against God, not believing God at his word. But did that mean that God was not sovereign over Israel? Did that mean that God was not sovereign over everything? And you see, that's going to be mirrored here in Romans 9, 10, and 11 when we talk about the rebellion of Israel rejecting Jesus as Savior. And as we dive into these three chapters, we're going to spend six weeks looking at these three chapters. This is the most hotly debated portion of the book of Romans. Some people come to Romans chapter 9, dealing with God's sovereignty, dealing with election and predestination, and they just shy away from it because they think, I can't understand these things. Well, the Bible does explain these things to a point. And my goal is for all of us here at this church to be painted into a corner to where we are forced to face the reality of God's sovereignty and to work work it out to see where we draw our conclusions. And so to, for my guiding principles as we walk through these three chapters, I'm using the Bible to explain the Bible. In fact, Paul's going to do that where he's going to quote so many passages from the Old Testament throughout these next three chapters. He will quote the Old Testament over and over again to explain himself. But also, we're going to line up with church history. Where did most believers over the church 
t- history timeline fall with Romans 9, 10, and 11. We want to seek to be faithful to God's word and to follow in the footsteps of those who have faithfully explained God's word. And so as we read this portion of scripture, you're going to have some questions. And Paul anticipates those questions and he answers those questions. And for some of you, you might be the way I was when I encountered Romans chapter 9 as a 23-year-old. I struggled with the portion we're going to go over next week. It made me question, well, God, why would you act in this way? Well, Paul anticipates those questions. And, And for all of us, my hope is that we all follow in Paul's footsteps, where Paul, at the end of this section on sovereignty, at the end of chapter 11, he just erupts into praise of God. Because God is, at the end of all things, someone that we cannot fully wrap our minds around. There is a mystery between the tension between man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. There is this mystery about God and the way that he works. And Paul's going to say, his ways are just unsearchable. Who can know them all? Who has given counsel to the Lord? And what we're going to do, my hope, is that as we're painted into a corner and forced to face these truths and wrestle with them, that it draws us to our knees in praise and awe and reverence of a God who is far, far above us. And so with that as our introduction, let's go ahead and get to work here in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. As we read about the good news of the gospel, which shows God's sovereign election. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. See, Paul begins this section knowing he's going to make a very large statement, one which some people might doubt if he is speaking the truth. And so Paul first starts off by saying he's speaking the truth in Christ. And then he goes the opposite and says, I am not telling a lie. If there's any question to the validity of the statement Paul's about to make, it should be doubly put to rest. Paul says that his conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit about what he's going to say, that he is telling the truth. Our conscience, it's like that inward barometer of right and wrong. You might recall from early in, earlier in Romans, our conscience excuses us or accuses us all day long. And Paul's conscience is not going to accuse him of telling a lie. It's not going to accuse him of being hyperbolic or over the top or dramatic in what he is about to say. And that truth is related to his great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. You see, the truth that Paul is speaking of is his heart being heavy with distress over the fallen state of his Jewish kinsmen. At all times, he has this anguish, this heaviness in his heart over the fact that many Jews have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior. And this is the burden that we should all have for those who are lost. For your family members, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your heart should weigh in your chest like an 80-pound bag of cement that you are just devastated by the fact that they have rejected Jesus Christ. And this should weigh you down, not in a way that debilitates you, but in a way that motivates you to spring into action. You see, Paul's heart for his Jewish kinsmen caused him to make a beeline for the synagogue on his missionary journeys. If you remember, Paul's title is the Apostle to the Gentiles. His ministry focus was to proclaim the good news to those who were not Jewish. That's those, many of us in this room would have been Paul's mission field. But when boots hit the ground, the first place he went was that synagogue. 
You see, he loved his Jewish brothers and sisters. They were his kinsmen. They were his family. And so he went after them by preaching the gospel to them. You see, your family, it might be a little tricky when it comes to sharing the gospel with your own family. But we see no hesitation in Paul. He went straight to the synagogue, even when it meant risking his life for the sake of reaching out to his Jewish kinsmen. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, they might revile you, they might reject you, they might just totally be turned against you, but you need to boldly tell them about Jesus Christ. Their response should not deter us from sharing the greatest news the world has ever heard. It did not slow Paul down at all. He continued on going, even after he was stoned and they left him for dead. The believers prayed, he stood up and he walked right back into the city. And he says here in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. See, this is the statement that Paul was saying that it's true. He's not lying. If it were possible, Paul would trade his salvation for the salvation of all the Jews. Now, we know that it's not possible. Paul's just written in chapter 8 that he was foreknown. We've been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. He's saved. He can't lose his salvation. He can't trade his salvation. But what Paul is saying is that if it were possible, this is what he would want to do. He would want to trade his own eternal destiny for that of his kinsmen. You see, Paul would become accursed for their sake. To be accursed is to be cut off from Christ. It's to be declared anathema. It's when you're condemned for hell and set outside of God's family forever. Those who are accursed are banned and cut off from God's family for all of eternity. And Paul is saying he would choose that if it meant the salvation of his brothers and sisters who are Jewish according to the flesh. And that begs a little question for you and me today. Would we trade our salvation for that of our family? Would we trade our salvation for that of our neighbors and our co-workers? If you could choose to give up your salvation and all the Gentiles would be saved, would you do it? I've wrestled with that question. Now, if we're talking the whole rest of the world, well, that's a lot of people. I think about that would seem fair. But if it's me trading it for one or two other people, would I really do that? Would I so much want to see somebody else be saved that I'd be willing to be cut off and a curse for Paul? He was not just making a show of this. He's being real. This is how he really felt deep down in his heart. This sorrow caused him to wish that he could do that for his kinsmen. Now, what you need to note is that Paul does not call them his kinsmen according to the Spirit. Not all Israel is Israel. Paul has been making this point throughout the book of Romans. Paul had a biological connection to the Jews, but he did not have a spiritual connection to all of them, only to those who had been saved. The Jews were his family. They were his friends and his heritage. And to verse 4, he says, they are Israelites, and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. So Israelites, they are the descendants and the offspring of Jacob. Jacob was given a new name when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord on the bank of the Jabuk River. If you recall that angel of the Lord, that was a pre-incarnate Christ, that Jacob is wrestling with the angel, and the angel gives him a new name. No longer will he be known as Jacob, but as Israel. And the name Israel means strives with God. Jacob was one who was striving with God literally, but also the nation of Israel would come to strive with God, constantly wrestling with God because they would allow pagan practices and idolatry into the nation. We've been learning about that in our adult Sunday school, Dig In, as we've gone through the book of Isaiah, which over and over again rebukes the people for worshiping the one true God according to the practices of the world, setting up high places the way that the world did, pagans did, to worship false gods, bringing idols into their midst and bowing and worshiping idols, sacrificing children to Molech. They were not to do those things, but they were striving and wrestling with God. 
But in spite of this, Israel was elected. And he says that they are given adoption. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament is referred to as God's son. And now this doesn't refer to spiritual adoption the way that Paul has been describing in Romans, right? He's been telling us that we've been adopted into God's family. We're not a slave, we're a son. We're not damned, we're daughters, right? We've been taken into God's family, adopted in. But that's not what he means here. You see, Israel was an elect nation, but not all people in the elect nation were elected to salvation, And so Israel, they were given this purpose to be a light to all the nations until the light of the world, Jesus Christ, would come in. And so as an elected nation, Israel, they received the glory, the covenants, the law, the worship, and the promises of God. And the glory, that was where God's glory was manifested, It was in the nation, the people group of Israel, where God chose to manifest himself before the world. We see this as Israel's being led out of their captivity in Exodus, being led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God's glory manifested for all to see. We see God's glory when the tabernacle was built, and it's filled with smoke, and Moses is told not to enter the tabernacle. When the temple is built and consecrated again, God's glory fills that temple through smoke. And it's in the temple, it's in the tabernacle that there's this inner part, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest would go and make atonement before the presence of God once a year. God's glory dwelt in their midst. And one day there would come a Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would dwell in their midst. It was a privilege they had as an elect nation. To them also went the covenants. Israel was the recipient of many different covenants. Covenants were the promises that God had made, first to Adam, then to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and now we are under the new covenant. The, the, the timeline of the Bible, we see God moving through these different covenants with his people. And these covenants were not given to those who are outside of Israel apart from the new covenant. He's giving these covenants mainly showing that through them is going to come Jesus Christ. Israel is elected. And God kept his covenant promises to Abraham to make Israel this great nation. So they had glory, covenants, but also the giving of the law. This is the Mosaic law that we've been referencing quite a bit here in Romans. Paul's been talking about how we're set apart from the law now. But to have the law was such a privilege and an honor. It was the word of God spoken. God did not give this word to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. He had given his ten commandments. He had given uh, rules and regulations for worship. He gave them laws for how they were to act as a nation and how they were to conduct themselves. There were promises given, both conditional promises and unconditional promises. So they were given the law. They were also given the worship. Of all the places in the world, it was Israel who was selected to be the place that the creator of the universe was to be worshipped. They were to light the candles of the, the, the tabernacle's lamp and the temple lamp. They baked the showbread. They butchered and offered sacrifices of animals. They offered incense. And there were those who were assigned the duty of keeping track of the instruments of worship. And so to them went the worship and the promises. This refers to those promises God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and David. The main promise being that the coming Messiah would come through their lineage. Jesus would come. He would be a greater prophet, a greater priest, a greater king, a judge to rule all the nations, a shepherd who would guard his people with a rod of iron the Messiah, the Savior, the one who would come and crush the head of the serpent. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. The patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These three men set as the head of the Israeli nation. It was these men whom God selected to bring forth his nation and ultimately to bring forth the promised Messiah. 
And now notice how this verse speaks both of Jesus' humanity and his divinity. Jesus was Jewish according to the flesh. That was his lineage. That was his heritage. But also Jesus is the holy child of Israel. He's the divine Messiah, the Christ who came to be the Savior of the world, the King of kings who conquered Satan, sin, and death. Jesus was given a new name, the name above all names, and he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. What a privilege and honor it is to be a part of a people group, to have the Messiah come forth, who is blessed forever. Amen. And Paul says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. Some people might think God's word has failed because of the way that Israel rejected Christ. He says, but not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. It is not as though the word of God has failed. God's word does not fail. God's word will always accomplish God's purposes. When the gospel is proclaimed, there will always be an effect. Our goal, our hope is that those who hear the gospel would come to repentance and saving faith. And when the gospel is preached, there are those who receive the gospel, who place their faith in Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, and are brought to newness of life. But there are many who reject the gospel. There are many who oppose God, and they hear God's word, and it reveals the condemnation that they have for their sins. God's word always takes effect. Now, when it says failing, has God's word failed? The idea is that of a ship that is going and goes off course and disappears it's also that picture of a flower that just withers and dies. Has God's word failed? Has God's word gone off course and been shipwrecked because many in Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah? Has God's word withered and died because many Jews did not receive Jesus Christ as the Son of God? No, by no means. God's word never fails. And Paul is going to explain why God's word did not fail. And this is where you need to pay very close attention to what Paul is teaching us in this passage. Because we need to understand what he is going to unpack about God's sovereignty and God's election and the way that God is moving and working. He says, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. See, not all those who are Jewish in the flesh are Jewish spiritually. The natural Jews, which we're going to learn about that as we go through this portion of Scripture, that refers to Jews who are Jews ethnically, uh, in their heritage, and in their nationality and culture. But spiritual Israel, that refers to the remnant who are saved by God's grace. They placed their faith in Jesus Christ and worshiped him with their heart. It's the difference between what Paul wrote about earlier on, between being circumcised in the flesh versus circumcised in the heart. If you remember in chapter 2, Paul said a true Jew is one who is a Jew inwardly. Many today are Jewish in their ethnicity and in their heritage, but they have rejected Jesus Christ. They do not follow him. They don't follow even the Torah anymore. Some claim that they might and they still follow parts of it, but many are just Jewish in their nationality. There are some who are abiding by the Torah as closely as they can, but they need to come to Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. See, the deep truths being taught here about God's sovereignty are about his selection and election. Election is selection. Abraham 
had many offspring and descendants as numerous as the stars, but not all children of Abraham are given his name. And even less of Abraham's children are considered the children of the promise, the children of God. You see, it's the children of promise who are God's children. Isaac was not Abraham's only son. Isaac wasn't even Abraham's firstborn son. Ishmael was. But Ishmael was not chosen to be that selected one through whom Christ would come. Isaac was selected. See, later on, Isaac then would have his own two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob would be chosen and not Esau. Ishmael and Esau, they are both fleshly, physical descendants of Abraham, but they were not the offspring of God's, they were not the offspring to bring about God's chosen people. They were the offspring of Abraham, the chosen one, but it was not God's choice to elect them as part of the nation of Israel. Paul goes on to explain in verse 8, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who were counted as offspring. You see, God's word had not failed because not all natural children are God's children. See, as Paul had pointed out earlier in Romans, not all of Israel are spiritual Israel. A true Jew is a Jew inwardly and spiritually. God had not given his promise to Ishmael, but he gave the promise to Isaac. And not all natural children of Abraham were God's spiritual children. God's spiritual children are the ones to whom he has given his promises. And not simply because they are a natural child of Abraham. So you need to understand, not every member of the chosen nation is a chosen person for salvation. The ones who are chosen for salvation, they are the children of promise. Those are the ones who are counted as the true children of Abraham. Election is selection. Now turn with me to John chapter 8. We're going to get a little bit more insight into um, what Paul is explaining here. Jesus has this encounter with the Pharisees, and it gives us some great insight into the difference between being a descendant of Abraham and being a child of Abraham, a spiritual child. Uh, the men who were here yesterday, we looked at part of this passage. But let's read John 8, verses 31 to 44. Jesus here is uh, having a little dispute between the Pharisees. And it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. Well, they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am he. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So note what Jesus is saying here about being a physical versus spiritual offspring of Abraham. He clearly confirms that they are the descendants of Abraham. Yet he clearly tells them that they are not Abraham's children, but Satan's children. The Pharisees were natural children of Abraham, but they were not spiritual children. They rejected Christ 
and their hearts were far from the one true God. Verse 9 of Romans 9, For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. When God told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, he was a 75-year-old man married to a barren wife. How in the world was he going to have children and be a great nation? Well, Genesis tells us that Abram believed God and God counted that faith as righteousness. He believed that God would raise him up into a mighty nation, but he didn't understand the timeline. And he didn't wait on God, but instead moved ahead and waited on himself. He moved ahead to try to make what God promised come about. Have you ever had trouble waiting on the Lord? Have you ever had a trouble waiting on God's timetable? Maybe you moved ahead and you realized, man, I should not have done that. I caused more grief than good. I should have waited on the Lord. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen to Abraham. Instead of having a child with his wife, she suggests, well, why don't you have a child with Hagar? And he does, and Ishmael is born. And so Abraham takes Ishmael before the Lord, and he tries to get Ishmael to become the child of promise. But God will not do that. Ishmael was not selected or elected to be that promised child. And by the time that Abraham is 99 years old, the Lord comes to him again, tells him to be circumcised, and tells him in a year you will have that promised child. And one year later, Isaac is born. See, it was not through Ishmael, but it was through Isaac. Isaac was the child of God's promise to Abraham. It was going to be through Isaac that Abraham would become that great nation and that all peoples of the earth would be blessed because of Jesus Christ. All nations would be blessed because through Abraham comes the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We who are in Christ have received the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Galatians 3 explains it to us. Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. God elects Israel because election is selection, and election is God's choice. Now, some of this might jostle you a little bit. Some of this might be hard to wrap your mind around. But as I said, I'm trying to paint you into a corner where you have to deal with these things. We have to come to an understanding as much as we are humanly able to. And that's why Paul sets aside these chapters. But there is still a mystery that remains. And now you might be starting to have some questions, and Paul's going to get to that. Verse 10. And not only so... But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Did you catch that line in there in verse 11? Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. You see, God's election of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob depended not on anything that they had done, or it wasn't based on their genetics. Isaac was chosen over Ishmael, but not because Sarah was his mom. It was chosen because that's who God chose. You see, Jacob and Esau, they have the same parents. There's not the same problem that Ishmael and Isaac had. They both had the same mom and the same dad. Yet Jacob is chosen over Esau. Esau should have received that birthright. He should have received that inheritance. But God chose Jacob as the child of promise. And now, you need to pay attention here. They, it was before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. You see, God elected them not because one day Jacob would go on to do something great. It was they were elected before they had the chance to do anything good where someone might say they earned or deserved election. 
And it was given to Jacob over Esau before any of them had done anything wrong that someone might look at and say, well, they deserved not to be elected. It was not based on anything they would do in the future, but based on God's past choice. His election was God's choice. See, God elects people for his own purposes. God elected Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as vessels to accomplish his purposes. God's purpose in Abraham was to bring about Jesus Christ. That's the main goal. It was in Jesus that all the nations would be blessed, including us. We are blessed because of Jesus Christ. For in Jesus Christ, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And that's why in Galatians 3, it says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but to one. And to your offspring, which is Christ. And so the Bible explains the Bible. Now Paul has clearly laid out to us that justification is not works. It is not works-based justification. We are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. And now we are seeing that election works in the same way. It's not based on our works, but on him who calls. Now in John chapter 1, John kind of gives us more detail as to what this looks like. In John 1 verses 12 to 13, he writes, To all who did receive him, to all who did receive Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So when you're born again, you're not born of your own blood, your own works. You're born of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not born of the will of your own flesh or the will of another man. It's not somebody else that's trying to will you to salvation. It is of God. See, it was not Ishmael, but Isaac, whom God had called. It was Esau, not Jacob, God had chosen. God chooses whom he will choose. And Ishmael went on to form the Ishmaelites, and Esau went on to form the Edomites. And both of these nations would clash against the Israelites. But God chose whom he chose. And in verse 12, she was told the older will serve the younger. And the older child would become subject and uh, subservient and inferior to the younger child. This prophecy fulfills itself as Israel goes into the promised land, becomes this great nation, and gets the oracles of God, the temple of God, eventually the Messiah. And there does come a time when, um, under King David, Israel sets up these garrisons, these fortresses in the land of the Edomites. And the Edomites become the servants in those garrisons. And verse 13 says, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now that's pretty strong, and we need to understand this phrase here. And this is where, as Christians in 2024, we need to look at the culture and the context of when the Bible was written. Remember, the Bible is written for you, but the Bible is not written to you. This isn't the book of Hagerstown Christian Church. We're reading the book of Romans. It is written to a congregation, but it is written for our benefit. And this phrase, to love one and hate another, as it refers to children, was what we'd call a Hebrew idiom or a just a uh, figure of speech, right? Like we have our own figures of speech in our culture. If uh, I was at the skate park, you might say, wow, Adrian was sick today. And now someone reading that in 200 years might think, oh, he must have been throwing up. But really, I was throwing down some good tricks, you know? And so we have these figures of speech, and for them, this was a figure of speech. When a child was given a greater inheritance than another child, it was said that that child was loved and the other was hated. You see, it was the fact that love denoted a strong, positive attachment to one child, and the withholding of affection was counted as hate to another child. Jacob received that special love from God to be chosen as a vessel to bring forth the Messiah. And Esau, he was not given those promises. He was not given those privileges. 
And by now, you may have had this question in your mind that Paul anticipates in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. See, the natural question we might ask is, well, if God is electing some people to himself and and chooses one person over another, does that make God unjust? Is God doing something wrong by electing and choosing and calling people to himself? Well, did anyone deserve to be called out from all people groups and to be raised up into a great nation? No. Abraham was a sinner like everybody else. For Isaac, was it unjust for him to be chosen over Ishmael? No. Neither one deserved to be selected as God's vessel. It was God's mercy to choose Isaac. And for Jacob and Esau, did Esau miss his chance when he gave his birthright and sold it for a cup of soup to his brother? No. It was part of God's predetermined plan. Before Esau had done anything good or bad, before Jacob had done anything good or bad, Jacob was chosen that way God's purpose of election might stand. Was it unjust for God to allow a snake like Jacob to become the man in the nation of Israel? Of course not. It was God's mercy that a sinful fallen human being would be used as a vessel for God's mercy and to glorify God. So when it comes to you and me, going back to Romans chapter 8, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, he called, justified, and glorified. Was God unjust in saving you? Well, by no means. You see, if God had chosen to show mercy and forgiveness to only one person on the planet, he would still be gracious and merciful and loving. And if God had decided not to save any of us, he would still be righteous and good. You see, it is God's choice to elect whom he chooses. And for you, this might be starting to raise some more questions that we will get into as Paul answers them in the next couple weeks. But my hope is that all of this will drive you to praise God for the way that he works because it is different than us. Because God is different than us. He is set apart as holy, as perfect, as pure, as infinite, as everlasting. And for our little piddly minds, who am I to stand up against God with my whole 40 years of experience versus his eternity? my little brain the size of a coconut to stand up against the almighty God and question the way that he's doing his things? No, I bow my head in humble mercy. The fact that God would do this for any one of us, for any mankind to show his mercy and his grace and to reveal himself to us and to take the blinders off any of us so we could see and bask in his glory just shows how good and amazing he is. So let's pray to him and let's thank God for who he is, but also for how he is, for what he does and how he does it.